Good morning, Table Church. We're going to read scripture together this morning. We're going to read out of Acts chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 13. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? But some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Table Church. And uh, thanks, Trevor, for reading that very difficult passage. <laughs> a lot of weird words in that one. Well done. Um, it's great to have you here today. Uh, if, you've, if you're new to Table Church, thank you for coming and checking us out. It's so great to have you. My name is Phil Wiseman. I'm the lead pastor here. And um, yeah, we're in a series on Acts right now, and uh, just the second week. So good time to show up. You know, when a nation conquers another nation... One of the most powerful levers that they can pull, one of the ways that they can subdue their enemy is through language, or more specifically, through taking away their language. If you want to eliminate their cultural identity, their history, if you want to change their worldview, if you want to force future, future generations to kind of get absorbed into your culture, then take away their language. Force your language on them and sideline their language. Did you know that the, the fact that you speak English uh, actually affects the way you view the world? The vocabulary that we have available to us in our languages actually affects how we view the world and how we view society and how we view culture. Language is very powerful. And nations know this when they conquer other nations. That's why they often force languages out of you. Because if you control the language, then you control a lot. Today, we're looking at one of the most remarkable miracles in the Bible. And what's going to happen is that God is going to use language to show us a very important lesson about the way his kingdom operates. It happens on the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is, of course, a Christian holiday where we, where we recognize the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. Uh, but it actually existed long before that. It was an ancient Jewish holiday, and it probably had something to do with celebrating the, the harvest. But whatever the case, on this particular Pentecost, things were going to take a surprising turn. The followers of Jesus are together in a room, and then suddenly a loud sound fills the room. It describes the sound as the sound of a, uh, the, sorry, the blowing of a violent wind, it says. I remember once I was in a tornado. I was in my basement, and there was a tornado right in our neighborhood, and it sounded like a train coming through. I don't know if you've ever been in a tornado, but that's all I could describe. It's almost like a train was coming through. It was a crazy sound. And so the sound like a violent wind fills the room. Notice it doesn't say it was actually windy in the room, just the sound. But interestingly, the Greek word for spirit is the same word for wind. And so this sound indicates the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And then we have this, this strange moment where it says, Tongues of fire rest on each of the disciples, and the Spirit enables them to speak in other languages. Now, the narrator, Luke, 
Uh, it seems like the sound of the wind was so loud that people could hear it even outside of the building that they were in because we're kind of transported to an outside scene where all these people are gathering. And so I can almost imagine this kind of earth-shaking sound that doesn't just happen briefly. It must go on and on long enough for people in different parts of the city to be like, what is that? Do you hear that? Let's go figure out what's going on. I mean, you know, in a world before machinery and, you know, amplification and stuff like that, to hear a, a super loud sound, you're like, what is this? The world was much quieter back then. And so people are gathering outside the building to try to figure out what's going on. And, and Luke tells us that there were, there were Jews from all over the world in Jerusalem at that time to celebrate uh, Pentecost. And so that's when they hear these Galileans uh, by the way, the reason why a Galilean is significant in the text is because a Galilean was not a very, um, uh, not a very, uh, from a very interesting part of the empire, just kind of a backwater corner of the empire, really. It'd be like uh, people from Arkansas or something. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, just like Galileans. What are these Galileans speaking all these languages for, you know? It says, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. By the way, in Acts chapter 2, when we talk about speaking in tongues, we're talking about that. We're talking about actual languages that they're suddenly able to speak, or at the very least, people are hearing them in their languages. Now, I had a mentor. Uh, when I lived in South Dakota, I had a mentor for 13 years. His name was Norman, and he was very old and very wise. And Norman had made his life's work mentoring and discipling young men. I mean, he had his day job, but really his, his work was discipleship and spiritual mentoring. And so I'm very blessed to have gotten to sit with him. We met at least twice a month for 13 years straight. Um, it, what, a, what a gift that was. But I remember a story he told me. See, Norman, he mentored lots of men, over 100 men, probably closer to 200 men by the time he passed away. And, uh, and a lot of them were pastors, and one of them was a, a Lutheran pastor, very conservative Luther, Lutheran pastor. And uh, this guy had actually served as a missionary in Japan. And so as a missionary, he had studied the language for many years and had gotten fluent in Japanese. But then he left the mission field and he came and, uh, and, and he served as a pastor here in the States. One day, a, a new couple shows up at his church. And, um, you know, that's always a cool thing when that happens. And so, like a good pastor, he reaches out to them and he says, hey, I would love to meet with you. Maybe we can grab coffee or something. And so they sit down. And this couple, they say, well, you know, we actually come from a Pentecostal background. There are not really many Pentecostal churches in this small town. Uh, and, and so we started attending your church, and we really like it, and we'd like to come. And uh, he said, okay, well, that's, that's wonderful. We'd love to have you. Uh, but, okay, but just uh, you got you to gotta not be speaking in any of those tongues during my sermon, he said. Like, I don't want to hear you speaking in tongues during our services. That was, that was his stipulation, I guess. And so things are going well for a number of weeks. And then one day, in the middle of his sermon, the woman stands up and starts speaking in tongues. And the pastor's like, what is this? And he's getting angry, and then suddenly he realizes she's speaking Japanese. Now, do you ever have a friend who likes to mess with you just to keep you on your toes? That's like what God is doing to this guy in this moment. He's just messing with him in order to keep him on his toes. He's like, I'm gonna mess with your theology a little bit just to make sure you understand that you don't get to box the Holy Spirit in. The Holy Spirit can do what he wants. In fact, Jesus says that he will blow where he wills. And so in Acts, we have this remarkable miracle of language, but some people are not impressed. It says, some, however, made, much fun, of them, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. I want to talk about this moment for a second. And um, I was, as I was studying this passage Preparing for this sermon, I read one scholar who has a very interesting uh, understanding. He kind of observes some, thing in this, some things in this text that I've, I've never noticed before. And so I want you to hang with me here because I'm going to try to explain it. And, I, and I, think, I, I think you can track with me, but hopefully I'll do a good job. So just lock in with me for a second. So if you've grown up hearing this passage, 
If you're like me, you've usually assumed that these mockers, these people that are, that are making fun, are making fun of the disciples. They're calling the disciples drunk because they hear them speaking gibberish. They're speaking in tongues. But the Latin American scholar, Justo Gonzalez, he encourages us to take a closer look at the text. He asks, okay, if it says right in the text, if everyone could hear them in their own language, then nobody heard them speaking gibberish. You would have just heard them speaking your language. And that's not particularly remarkable. That's not, you know, that doesn't constitute grounds for accusing somebody of being drunk. And so it must have been another thing that they were accusing uh, of, of, of drunkenness. See, many of us have assumed that the mockers are accusing the disciples of being drunk because they were speaking in tongues, but that doesn't seem to make sense. They would have just heard them speaking in their own language. Instead, Gonzalez suggests that the mockers actually think that it is the crowd of foreigners that is drunk, not the disciples. Now, why is this? Well, it's because they're suddenly acting so amazed that they can hear the, and understand the disciples speaking in their language. But, but of course, the people making fun, the mockers, are part of the dominant culture, and so they simply heard them speaking in the language they would expect to hear them speaking in, so nothing significant was happening to them. And they're looking around, wondering why everybody's freaking out when this seems like a perfectly normal occurrence. Uh, imagine I got up here and you hear me speaking English, right? That happens every Sunday. But then suddenly Moses jumps up and he starts shouting out, Namwalewa! I understand him in Swahili because Moses could hear me in Swahili. We, if, you, if you heard Moses do that, you'd be like, what's wrong with Moses? <laughs> so, hey, guys, something got into Moses. I'm a little worried, you know. But here's the thing. You English-only speakers would not comprehend the miracle because you're not an outsider. See, this interpretation is confirmed in verse 15. Peter stands and notice, Peter doesn't say, we are not drunk. He says, these people are not drunk. He's talking about the crowd of foreigners who didn't speak his language. Now, if Gonzalez is right about this, I think this is a pretty cool thing because in this moment, it's like the the outsiders become the insiders, like the disadvantaged become the advantage and those who are, who are on the inside, those who expect to understand suddenly don't. Jesus says that in his kingdom, the last shall be first. And here it is. The people on the margins get it. The people in the center suddenly don't. Now, last week we learned a theological word. It's the word apocalyptic. Apocalyptic you need to put away all the scary images from Hollywood of the world ending in a, I don't know, big meteor or something. Apocalypse simply means an uncovering or revealing, or revealing. That's what apocalypse means. The book of Revelation, the word is apocalypsis. That's the name of the book. It's a, a revelation, a revealing, an uncovering. And what we learned is that the kingdom of God is apocalyptic. In other words, it, it reveals a completely different, a completely alternative way to live. You see, the kingdom of God is backwards from what we know and what we understand. It operates like a completely different kind of kingdom. And so it must be revealed to us. It must be apocalypsed to us because we cannot get there through human reason alone. Paul even says about the gospel, he says, this was not taught to me by human wisdom. It was revealed to me. It was apocalypsed to me. The kingdom of God works so different than anything that we would naturally assume or think that we know. It's apocalyptic. And Acts is showing us the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. It's a place where the outsiders are brought in. Those who think they've got it can completely miss it. Now earlier I told you that when a worldly kingdom conquers another, one way that it can dominate its subjects is with language. African-American theologian Willie James Jennings puts it very sharply. He says this, Imagine people in many places throughout history and many conquered sites in many tongues all being told that their languages are secondary and inferior to the supreme languages of the enlightened peoples. Make way for Latin, French, German, Dutch, Spanish, and English. These are the languages God speaks. Imagine centuries of submission and internalized hatred from mother tongues and in the quiet spaces of many villages and many homes, women, men, and children practicing these new enlightened languages, not by choice, but by force. 
The point he's making is clear. It's this. The kingdoms of the world demand conformity. The kingdom of God becomes all things. You know that passage from Paul? He says, I've become all things to all people that by any possible means I might save some. See, the world says, learn my language, do things my way. The Holy Spirit translates. The gospel is meant to be shared. The good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he lives and reigns, is something we're not supposed to keep to ourselves. Listen, one of the signs that the Holy Spirit fills a people is when they find new ways to bring the gospel to others. And one of the signs that a people has maybe lost the Holy Spirit is when they expect others to conform to them. And I'm a little worried that the church has done a lot of that second one. If you've been attending Table Church for a while, you'll notice, you've noticed that every now and then we do something a little different. We, we uh, translate our, our services into Swahili. Um, and on those days, we bring in some of the families from our Rise Up Tutoring program uh, so, that, so that we can worship together. Now, I love those Sundays, but I also, I, I don't really like preaching through translation. It's just, it's, well, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, a little annoying. It's hard to get into a rhythm. It's hard to develop thoughts and these sorts of things. It's just the nature of it. But many of you have told me that you appreciate those Sundays, and I know you do, and I'm glad you do, and it's, it's kind of fun and different to do something like that. But I wonder what we would all feel like if we did it every week, you know? I wonder what would happen if we st- said, okay, every Sunday is Swahili Sunday. We're going to translate every line half English, half Swahili. I wonder what would happen. What would happen to attendance and involvement? I wonder if those who are inside would start to go down and maybe those who are outside might start to go up. Hard to say, right? But the whole point of it is that in some small and imperfect way, we are trying to do what the Holy Spirit did at Pentecost. We're trying to translate the gospel. And in order to do that, Listen, we have to deprogram, deprogram the ways of this world that say, like, they got to conform to me. Things, things, that, things must look the way I want it. I must be served. I must be entertained. I must have things easily accessible to me. We have to try to get rid of that, and we have to start saying, hey, how can I become all things? Here's what I think this passage is telling us. It's this. We need a new generation of spirit-filled gospel translators. People who are going to take the gospel. Notice when I say translate, I'm not saying change. I'm not saying change the gospel. I'm saying translate the gospel into a way that other people will be able to understand it. Uh, Moses and I were in the apartment complex where many of our Rise Up students live. By the way, if you don't know this, we operate a tutoring program uh, for students at Edmonds Elementary and um, many of the students are Swahili speaking. And so we were in the apartment complex and um, there was a couple of guys with white shirt, button up shirts on and uh, they were Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, I'm not sure which. And uh, they were speaking Swahili, sharing their message with the, with the residents of that apartment complex. They had taken a few years to learn the language in order to go share it with them. And I thought, oh man, why didn't I do that? You know, like, what are we doing, right? Like, you got to respect the, the effort. At the same time, that should just be something we do. That should just be something we do. We have a huge history of it. In the 5th century, there was St. Patrick. As a teenager, St. Patrick was kidnapped by Irish pirates and taken to Ireland as a slave. While in Ireland, he, one way or another, he encountered the living God and started to follow him which is unique because it was a very pagan country. There wasn't Christianity in Ireland. And so uh, he he devotes his life to God. He eventually escapes from slavery and makes it back home and becomes a priest and asks to become a missionary and to be sent to Ireland. He goes back to the place of his captors because he had a heart that broke for those people. And so he goes back to Ireland and he goes up and down the countryside starting missions and preaching the gospel and converts an entire nation. And famously, he would use a three-leaf clover in order to explain the Trinity to people. And as a result, an entire nation was changed. In the 18th century, God used John Wesley to ignite a revival in England. 
And the innovative thing that John Wesley did was he preached outside. Yes, this was scandalous in the time. You don't preach outside. That, that's unbecoming of a preacher. The gospel belongs within the proper place, within a church. But John Wesley said, I'm going to take the gospel to the people that need to hear it. And so he would go out into the fields. He would go into the city square and he'd start preaching. He'd preach to the poor. He'd preach to the, the, the blue-collar workers who often uh, were ignored. Uh, he, would, he would preach to the people that nobody else was preaching to. And he took the gospel to them. And you know what? One of the greatest revivals since, like, the book of Acts happened because of that. Back in 2009, we planted a church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now, this church, we met in an old, um, disgusting, sticky, moldy movie theater. When I, uh, when I say it's old and disgusting, I'm not exaggerating. Like, they, they tore it down right after we left. I'm pretty sure that our rent checks were the only thing keeping it going. And as soon as we left, they closed it and tore it down. There's now a parking lot there. So we met in this disgusting old movie theater. And I remember back in 2009, planting a church in a movie theater in Sioux Falls, South Dakota was kind of edgy, kind of unheard of. Like, whoa, look at these young people doing this crazy thing. And now it's not a big deal. In fact, I was on the Cinemark website yesterday. They've got a tab for church planters. Like, hey, want to plant a church in our movie theater? We'll make it happen. They've figured out this income stream that is available to them. <laughs> so back then, though, it was like, whoa, well, you're, you're meeting where? And I remember people would, Christians, they would we'd tell them, and they'd be like, well, well so do you ever want to get your own church? And we're like, you mean building? Because that ain't the church, right? The church is the people. Sure, we'd love to get our own building someday, maybe. We'll see how it goes. And, and I remember one time we were talking to a guy, he's like, wait, so you set up well, how do you do it? And we're like, well, we set everything up and we, and we had to tear it down, put it away in a trailer after church. And he's like, oh, that must be awful. And we're like, well, I mean, it's actually not that bad. Like, it's pretty cool like, what God is doing. But what, what we noticed was the people who didn't go to church, people who hadn't stepped foot in a church building for decades or maybe ever, they'd be like, oh, the Carmike Movie Theater, I know where that is. I was just there last week. And it was amazing how many people would come and hear the gospel and accept the gospel through that experience. Timothy Keller was a pastor in Manhattan. He recently passed away. One thing I really respected about Tim Keller was his ability to speak the language of a secular and sophisticated Manhattan culture. He would explain the gospel and how it makes better sense of our moral compass than secular humanism does. You know, he would, he would point to how we have these values for human rights and human dignity. And he'd say, that's true, and that's good, and that's wonderful, but where does it come from? People haven't always thought this way. Go back to ancient Rome. They didn't care about your dignity unless you were one of the elites. How come all of a sudden now everybody thinks dignity ha belongs to everybody? Like, crazy as, mu as much as it sounds to us, right? It wasn't always that way. Why do you think it's that way now? You need to point to the fact that, like, the gospel has had an indelible mark on the Western world. And so he could speak their language, and he could translate the gospel into, into things that would, that would be helpful for them, that would make sense for them, where they could see the value of it. These are all instances of following the example set for us by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Last month, we here at Table Church, we had to complete what's called our, the local church statistical report. And this is something that every church does every year for the denomination, and it's, it's a real big pain in the, in the neck. Um, it's a long report where they ask all sorts of stats and numbers and finances, and you have to dig through stuff and figure, like, nobody likes doing it. All the pastors complain about it on Facebook, like, but we have to do it. It's just one of those things like, you know, taxes and stuff. Like, you just got to do it. And so we're filling out our statistical report, and one of the things that they ask is the number of conversions and the number of baptisms that you've had in the past year. This year, we put down one conversion and two baptisms. Now, I want to be clear, I praise the Lord for one conversion and two baptisms. You can't put a value on any of those things. I also think that I can say 
that one conversion and two baptisms per year ain't enough. And it's not because I just want splashy numbers on a statistical report. I'll be honest, I'm not convinced anyone reads those things. <laughs> it's because I want to follow the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. I wrote in my prayer journal that day, I wrote, God, by your grace, I never want to put those numbers down again. And I was rather convicted about it. You see, as the leader, I think it's my job to cast a vision for that. And I hadn't done it very well in the last year. Here's the good news. Uh, our year, our church year starts in June. It's kind of weird. But so we have a new year as of June 1. Uh, we've, uh, we have a baptism scheduled for the end of June, June 25th. And it's looking like between baptisms and conversions, we're already, we're already going to meet last year. <laughs> and so we're at, after one month, we're going to be doing a lot better than we were last year. And I just hope that it continues to grow. Look, we do many good things at Table Church. We do many gospel-centered things at Table Church. But we can't let good things keep us from the main thing. And that's what Acts chapter 2 should remind us of. And so... I want to end today by saying things very clearly, and it's this. If you're here and you don't follow Jesus, or you don't know if you do, or you think you do, but if you're really honest with yourself, you're not really sure, and you're like, ah, I'm not sure Jesus is really my number one priority, listen to me. I believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and in that moment, a fatal blow was dealt to evil and sin and death, and not just the evil in the world, but the evil in your heart. I believe that through Jesus, the things that sin has destroyed in your life can be put back together and redeemed. I also believe that he is inviting you to join him in bringing that renewal to others. Listen, it all starts by doing this thing we call surrendering your life to Jesus. Submitting to the lordship of Christ is the stuffier way to say it, I think. But I say it because, you know, the early Christians, when they wanted to say the gospel in the, most, in the shortest, most concise form, here's what they would say. They would say three words, two words in Greek. Jesus is Lord. That's how, if you're walking down the street, you see a buddy of yours who goes to church, you're like, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's how you know. That guy's a Christian. So you want to know if you're a Christian? Answer this question. Is Jesus your Lord? You know what Lord is? The supreme Lord. Lord in, in the ancient world can mean a lot of things. It's like sir. It's just like it could be a, a term of, you know, respect. But everybody knew that there was one supreme Lord, and his name was Caesar. And so when the Christians would say Jesus is Lord, what they're saying is like, Caesar ain't my Lord. Jesus is. He is the supreme Lord of my life. And so saying those three words was dangerous. It meant that you were putting your life at risk. Because you're saying, I no longer agree that Caesar is Lord. I think he's a pretender to the throne. I believe that Jesus is Lord. So listen, if you're ready to take that step, it's easy. Just circle the cross on your connection card. Or shoot me an email. Or come talk to me sometime. Any of those things. The cross is nice because that way I'll see it on Monday and I will reach out to you. And we can talk about what it means to follow Jesus. Also, on June 25th, I already mentioned it, we're going to have a baptism that day. Um, baptism, let me explain. We're going to have, a, on June 17th, there's an informational meeting about baptism. Uh, so if you ha are a follower of Jesus, you've never been baptized, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and let me explain baptism real simple to you. Um, you know how in school, in public school, you stand and you say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning? And then, you know, you put your hand on your heart? Baptism is our Pledge of Allegiance. Baptism is our putting our hand on our heart. Baptism is where you say, I pledge my allegiance to Jesus. He is the one that rules my life. He is the one that I follow. And so when you go down under the water, it's like you're dying and being buried in the ground. And when you come back up, it's like you're being raised to life in Christ. You're no longer living for yourself. You're living in Christ. So baptism is our pledge of allegiance. And it's a way that we say to the world, Jesus is Lord. And so if you've not been baptized, 
uh, I would love for you to consider it. Just write baptism on your connection card and I will follow up with you on that as well. Um, and again, we have a, an informational class on June 17th at nine o'clock at the ministry center. If you can't make it to that, no problem. We'll figure out something else. So Table Church, let's become gospel translators in your workplace, in your neighborhoods. And look, it can start very simple. In fact, you'll hear me talk more about this next Sunday, but one of the things that I want to see us do is what if we all commit to praying and to asking God and to, and to being obedient to him to invite just one person to church this summer? You know, studies show that most people say if they would be invited to church, they would say yes. But studies also show that most Christians never invite anybody to church. And so there's an opportunity just waiting for us. And of course, I want you to share the gospel in your own personal way, share your story and your testimony with people. But sometimes just inviting them to church can be kind of a less threatening thing to do as well. And then they can come and they can look around and they can see, hey, these people don't look too weird. Like, I, I think I could... I think I could fit in with these guys. So who might that person be? Let's commit to praying for that this summer and let's just see what God does. Would you pray with me? Well, Lord God, I ask that today your spirit would fall on us. Um, Lord, that we would realize that we are not alone in this room, that you are here and that you're working among us and in us and that you want us to go out and be gospel translators. And so empower us to do that. Give us opportunities to do it. And Lord, give us the courage to be obedient when it comes. And Lord, for anybody here today who just decided that they need to follow you, that they need to submit to your lordship, Lord, I ask your spirit to fall on them right now with assurance and with power and with love and grace. Lord, help us to be a church that translates your gospel, your truth, your good news in a way that the world just says, there's something different here. I got to find out more. We love you, Lord. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us now as we sing one last song?